everybody, and welcome to another episode of Book Goodies, the podcast for authors by authors. I am your host, Deborah Carney, and today we have with us uh, novelist Laura Fodi. Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I'm so glad you could join us today. Uh, can you give our listeners a little bit of background about yourself? Sure. I um, work as a social media consultant right now, doing tweeting and blog posts and that kind of thing for various clients. I, before that, I was a journalist, and I spent a lot of years doing interactive multimedia back uh, before the web was really a big thing. So That's really cool. I, I'm a pre-web webber, too. Oh. <laughs> Um, it's a lot of people don't realize that there was an internet before there was a World Wide Web. Correct. And That's why I say web rather than internet. Exactly. Um, so now you uh, recently wrote a book, and why don't you tell us about your novel? Okay, it's called The Cusp of Everything, and that relates to the feeling that you have when you are just sort of on the verge of adulthood, of going out on your own for the first time feeling like you've been constrained by living at home with your parents and all the other things that go into growing up, and now you're on the cusp of your real life, of getting out there in the world and making things happen. And it takes place in the 70s, specific, specifically 1975 to 76. It starts on July 4th, 75, and ends on the bicentennial, so that's sort of a big part of the, the ending, the celebration of the bicentennial. And it's mostly a story about a friendship between a straight girl and a gay guy. That's awesome. And you know, we there's a lot of us, uh, a lot of us women that have straight uh, have gay men that are uh, really good friends. And uh, I don't know if it's because they're really safe or if because they're, you know, what it is about them. But it's it's uh, it's a good premise for a friendship. It's it's uh, I'm I'm intrigued by the book because. It's almost like having uh, another girlfriend to talk to because you kind of have the same problems, although he has more issues, especially in the 70s. Than, than Things she, were very yeah. different in the 70s. I, I call the book Will and Grace the Teen Years because there's sort of a whole history um, up to teenagers growing up together, and especially in the 70s when being out of the closet was not so common. Mm-hmm. I think it was much more... More, more common then to for girls to have crushes on boys and not know that they were gay. They're just sort of the most, you know, empathetic and understanding. Like to shop, you mm-hmm. know, willing to talk about to the, you know, Bobby Sherman or whoever the, the big singers are. Um, there's there's such a connection there that that feels like love. Um, mm-hmm. And when when uh, gay is not on the table as it really wasn't back then, um, it, it it's hard not to think that maybe it's something that it's not. Right. And like you said, it's because the guys are so empathetic and so uh, so more in tune with the female side of things. And you know, I'm not being stereotypical. It just happens to be that you know, gay guys happen to be more in tune with women. And yeah, it's really easy to get crushes on them because you know, especially back then when you didn't know, you thought, "Wow, these guys are really cool." So different from the rest. I know. How can you find a guy that does that? Now, how did you um, how did you go about di- uh, writing the novel? Did you uh, did you do a timeline? Did you have it all played out? I did. Out? I, I did an outline. I, I knew that I wanted to start it in the summer of seventy five. Uh, that was the year that I graduated from high school, and and that was just a really interesting time in society. So many things were changing. Nixon had just been forced out of office and. Uh, abortion had just been made legal and people were starting to get divorced in droves. It was such a time of change and the bicentennial was such a, a, a big, big time back then. It's sort of forgotten now, but there, there was a whole year leading up to it where you mm-hmm. just heard nothing but bicentennial this and, you know, McDonald's glasses and everything else. It was a huge celebration and I just sort of wanted to go back to that time. I, I worked at an amusement park that summer of 75 and I had gone back there to visit and found out that someone I had worked with had, had died recently, my, my first boyfriend. And so that really inspired that angle of it. And originally when I started writing, I thought I would write mostly about the whole idea of the summer love and, you know, create these characters who met at an amusement park and went from there. But once I started writing, I found that there wasn't really that much for me anyway to say about a summer love. Um, it was a long-term thing because when you're a teenager, 
they don't tend to last very long and right. you know you're sort of stumbling on along finding your way um, and what really turned out to resonate more with me was the, the character of the gay friend uh, who who um, you know has the longevity and, and uh, friendship versus romance is a big theme in the book and who are really the people that, that stay with you for your whole life and the people that, that are your friends, that the family that you build for yourself. And that's that's really important. That's a really important book for teenagers to read because they think that every love is the one that's going to be for the rest of their life. And oh, yeah, that you should blow off your girlfriends because you've got a date, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it was... You know, I, I talked to a teenager over the past couple of years. I've been, uh, I have a friend who has a teenage son that uh, looks upon me as a, uh, you know, a confidant. And he's like, oh, this is the girl for me. I love her so much. And I'm like, come back to me in six months. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see where you stand. And, you know, he was, it, it's very interesting to watch. Uh, I haven't had a teenager in a long time, so it's it's very interesting to watch teens go through that, where yes. everything is drama and everything. Which again, you know, the gay guys play right into that. So you know, right. the girl drama and the boy drama, and you know, you can be very dramatic with each other, and you can paint each other's fingernails and toenails, and you know, talk on the phone for hours about how evil men are. <laughs> <laughs> And our girls, how evil, how evil other girls are, and um, I, I like the premise for the story. So, well, thank you. All right. So now, technically, like you planned it out, you said you didn't outline. Is that like just a you know for other people that are thinking about writing a book? Now, you know, you you've inspired me already to think about. I've already got a book in my head to write about a particular um, nine month period in one of my son's lives. So. You know, you've even spurred on to, you know, creating a novel out of another year, like you said, that is a year that was impactful. And, you know, I graduated in 74, so you're 75 to 76. That's, you know, that's when I was right out of high school and going to college, and I was going to major in computer science, and I was, you know, people were, you know, everywhere and stuff, and, you know, and I ended up falling in love, dropping out of college, and getting married. I'm divorced now, so don't do that right after you get out of high school. (laughs) Well, I was 30, and I'm divorced now, too, so there's no... uh, Yeah, (laughs) so it's... Yeah, there's no magic bullet. So, you know, that year was, again, like you said, it was a very tumultuous year for the country, and it was a celebration, and everybody wanted to go to Niagara Falls, and, you know, you wanted to do all the big things around the country because there were right. all these celebrations everywhere. But now, as a writer, how do you how do you capture that, and then what kind of things did you use to, because it is based on, it's fiction, but it's based a little bit on facts, so you have to keep your facts straight throughout right. the year. How did you manage that? Was, that, that was a big part of what I had to do is, is research. And, and also I should mention that the spine of the book is music. Um, I also worked in the music business for a while. I wrote for Billboard and Rolling Stone and, and worked for a couple of record companies. And um, music has always been a huge part of my life. And, and in many ways, when I'm trying to remember those times or any times, often music is, is key to sparking memories of, you know, who were you with and what was it like and what else was going on. So um, the character, the gay character in the book, whose name is Mark, he has uh, sort of an obsession with the Supremes, so there's a lot of Supremes music. Um, there are songs that were on the radio at the time, the Eagles, one of these nights, and you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and they go to a gay disco a couple of times. So what was playing, and this is the very early days of disco, it didn't really even exist yet as a format. Right. Um, there wasn't even a, a, a chart in Billboard yet called Disco. It was still, a, you know, dance club music. I right. Think. Um, but th- some of the things that were being done and are played in clubs at that time became the foundation of what came later and really, in many ways, what's still happening today. Um, some of the early, quote-unquote, disco artists. So I, I put together a playlist. That was one of the first things I did. I want to make sure I include all of this music. I cross-checked it with... Um, this fabulous Billboard Hits book by Joel Whitburn, who's sort of the chart expert, and uh, made sure that I wasn't including anything that hadn't been released yet or wouldn't have been on the radio at the time, right. wouldn't have been available. 
And then I looked at what was happening in the world and, and what was important to the story that needed to be included, maybe what movies would these kids be going to see, uh, what news might they be talking about, what were they watching on television. Um, I really wanted to create a sense of what the popular culture was of the time. And I also wanted to create a sense of place. I grew up in Westchester, New York, and you know, you read a lot about the suburbs. The ice storm is a particular favorite of mine, and you know, some of Philip Roth's stuff. But they're not really very specific about place. And right. I wanted to really uh, paint a picture of what Westchester was like in the 70s, all the bowling alleys that are gone now, the drive-in movie theaters, the, you know, the French restaurants with fondue. And uh, This is true in small towns across the country, all of these things disappeared, but I wanted to talk specifically about the ones that were there in Westchester at the time. So that sort of helped me uh, create a timeline, and of course the characters, what was happening in the characters' lives uh, had to be thought through. So there was an arc, you know, she has a crush on him, she finds out he's gay, and what, you know, she finds out he has a crush on her other gay friend, and, and uh, who she <laughs> also didn't know but was gay in high school. Um, and where do they go from there? Right. Uh, how do they do? They stay friends because that was such a traumatic event to find out that you know the person you thought one way about is not that way. And was he lying to you? Was he lying to himself? And you know it's, this is all very big drama for teenagers. Yeah, so that, that helped me shape the timeline. That that's really awesome that you put it together that way, and that's really helpful for um, anybody who wants to do a story based in a particular time in history. And I, uh, you've just helped me out with something that, that, you know, I mean, we all think we remember things, but then, you know, was Rocky in the seventies or was Rocky in the early eighties? It's very important to me to, to be accurate about that. Yeah. You know, you talk about, you know, you're going on a date and you're standing in the rain for hour, for an hour to get into the movie and you get in there and you suddenly forget everything because the movie is so great and it has to be one of those great movies if you, and if you do it at the wrong time period, your readers are going to go, Wait, what? That that's, right. that's not right. And then you lose your audience. So you're, you know, you lose a little bit of confidence from the reader for you. Right, exactly. And you need to really be authentic because um, there are people that are going to read your book that, you know, weren't alive yet in the 70s. Or that, right, and they're not going to know one way or the other if I'm off by a year, but, but those who were alive will know. Yeah, and their parents are going to be, you know, they're going to tell their parents about the story or they'll tell their friends about the story and they're going to be like, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> and um, so I'm glad that you you laid out that, that timeline really clearly. And it is funny because um, I had a, a friend that I thought, had a crush on me but he was kind of using me as the safe person to be able to like go to the prom with and whatever because you know I was a little, I was a little bit oh yeah I was the beard and and I didn't know it but we all knew that he was different and he grew up in a family of very strong women so I like to say that if I grew up in that family I'd be a gay guy too because <laughs> I wouldn't want to go anywhere near any women because he had like you know five older sisters and a very dominating mother and you know, the girls were all about drama and were all about, you know, hormones. And, and it was like every time you walked in their house, there was there was always a drama going on. And and I like I to know t- that kind of house very well. Yeah. And I know, it, it's really funny because, you know, later on in life, when I met him at a, accidentally at a job, you know, one of the first things the person who introduced me to him, and this was probably in the late 80s, said to me, um, you know, I said, "Oh, I grew up with David," and they're like, um, "Well, you know, he's the he, he's in the gay men's quartet." And I'm like, yeah, "This is no surprise to me. Don't worry." <laughs> we all knew back then that he was not straight. <laughs> but um, and those well, are I, I, I just show my book to someone early on before I was finished, and, and they said, "You know, I, it was a guy." He said, "You know, I just don't." It doesn't ring true to me because she would have known this earlier that he was gay and she would have had her gaydar working. And I said, gaydar? There was no gaydar. There was no gaydar back then. Yeah, we There used was to... one gay guy that everybody knew and that was Liberace. And, and, yeah. Uh, you know, he was considered to be sort of, you know, a fluke or a freak or, you know, the, we didn't really think that there were too many more like him. I mean, every now and then you'd hear a comment about, you know, a sort of gay-oriented 
but it was insulting and it was meant, you know, that the person, the guy was a, a wimp. It wasn't really taken seriously, certainly by me, that that, that was actually <laughs> Yeah, I know. When life. people... Yeah, I was completely clueless. When people said, started to say Elton John was gay, you're like, no. He's married. How could he be gay? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, even Boy George at the beginning, although we should have known that right from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, we should have known that. You know, it was... Uh, so. But it's, you know, like you said, in the 70s, it wasn't acceptable. And so she had a crush because she thought he was such a great guy. And especially being in a suburb and not being in a metropolis, you know, not being in New York City where maybe it was more open and, you know, people were starting to come out in a, in a community, you had to be very careful. And like you said, there was all the negative connotations and, and all that. And to be able to bring that through the story, I think, is, is uh, I think that sounds like the perfect premise for, uh, for a teenage yeah. years and that it's not your normal you know the girlfriends or like you said the summer romance that doesn't last right and right I, I um I, I think it makes the book really a period piece because there you know things were so different then and you know everybody wasn't out of the closet nobody even knew that there was a closet I was just gonna say that, that nobody it, knew it there was really a was such a different time and that's what I wanted to capture and it, it has come across to some people as being you know almost like a fairy tale that well you know that's not possible that it, it would have been so obvious the fact that he liked Diana Ross you know she yeah. a giveaway <laughs> and you know I think that there were that that really just was not the case back then and it's sort of hard to believe now but um you know <laughs> and and right actually, <laughs> in a and even though you're getting that pushback, I think there's a lot more people that are going to resonate with it, and especially people from small towns that are going to say, you know, we didn't. Oh yeah, realize. Well, I definitely have had that feedback too. I'm not trying to make it sound like everybody thinks that uh, yeah. people should have known immediately, but but uh, it, it has come up a few times, and, and mostly from people who were younger and just really didn't know that um, that that's the way it was. Right. And now, okay, so then you, you, you plotted everything out, very, a lot of research to get the timeline right, a lot of soundtrack, which I think is brilliant, um, because I was talking to another author yesterday, and she used something about food, and she was, it wasn't a culinary memoir, but it was something about food that spurred certain memories, and all of a sudden, all my memories of you know, uh, how my grandmothers, you know, cooked and what that meant and how they had the big, you know, kitchens and all that. And that did spur memories. So whatever you can use that will connect to people, music is a big one. You know, you know what you were thinking as a teenager when you were listening to um, uh, anybody. You know, you're listening to Bobby Sherman and you're going, oh. He's so cute. And I haven't listened to him since the 60s or 70s or whenever he was big. Yeah. And so when you hear it, it takes you back. It's not like a Beatles song that maybe you've heard many times over the you know, yeah. intervening decades. Some of these songs I deliberately chose because they were on the radio at the time and really never heard again. So when you hear it, it takes you back in a yeah. way that something like, you know, Cool and the Gang Celebrate is not going to do because it's played at every single event that you ever go to. Right. So and things like... Fun. Um, things like Hall and Oates and all those, you know, love songs, and you're like, oh, right. the boyfriend that doesn't know that I like him, you right, know. Right. And Jackson Brown was a big one. Yeah. So those are all those are all really important to spur memories from people. And um, even though you didn't write a memoir, you wrote fiction. It still helps you to bring back the feeling, so right. that when you're writing, you're you're writing in that in that emotion. And I think that's important for our authors that are listening to know that to make your book more authentic includes some of these elements. You know, um, unless you have your, your piece set in a time where, you know, time is unspecific and, and you don't have much history in your book. Um, I think most books can get more authenticity if they have some elements like music and current events and things put in even though you want your book to be evergreen you also want it to be authentic to the time that you're telling it in you know like well, I, think it is, I think it is evergreen to be specific and, and historically accurate you know i think mm-hmm. that's what makes um even books that are written about contemporary times uh, when you read them you know decades later they they still resonate even though that show may not be on tv anymore or that president may not be in the white house anymore you know those those pieces of those color colors help fill in the picture. Yes, and, and it needs to be accurate. 
And like the movies, like the American Pie movies, you know? I right. mean, we can go back to that time even though we didn't live it, and you can experience it. And I think that's really important for period pieces and memoirs both, that, you know, they're showing a time in history that's, you know, a lot of people now haven't haven't lived through. And to portray that accurately is especially important. Now, um, what are some of the... Now, how did you get your book published? Did you go with a traditional publisher? Did you go with a small press? Did you go with a... With self-publishing? I, I decided that um, because I had a soundtrack, I really wanted to be published by one of... I, I really wanted to be published through Amazon and um, tie in through Amazon as an affiliate because I have an affiliate relationship with them to sell things through Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could also have a jukebox on my website or links on my website that would play the songs or pieces of the songs. Right. Uh, so a, a publisher that could tie me to Amazon or iTunes or Apple um, was really my priority and I couldn't quite figure out how to even go down that road. It took me so long to write the book. I didn't want to spend another year shopping it around and trying to figure out rights that may or may not be needed to, to you know, sort of incorporate them into the ebook, that kind of thing, which is still a dream of mine. So I just self-published it and I went through CreateSpace, the Amazon mm-hmm. uh, division for the print book and Book Baby for the ebook. Okay. And I have a website, cuspofeverything.com, where I have an, an Amazon list and an iTunes jukebox and also a Spotify, uh, which is a wonderful music service, a Spotify jukebox. Those, all three of those are on the website. So there are multiple ways to hear the music. And when you see a song mentioned, you know, they said some of it's a little esoteric, so you may not, you may not know uh, a particular song. You can go on the website and hear at least a piece of it, uh, in some cases a full song if it's on Spotify. But they don't have everything, unfortunately. Right. Uh, so um, that was important to me. I, I would still like to get it published as a book through a major publisher uh, or even a small press. Um, I'd also like to see it as a movie, but you know, what, what author wouldn't like that? I did have a friend of mine sent it to someone she knew who was an agent in New York who wrote back and said, I'm sorry, we're not accepting historical fiction. That was like a nice <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> the 70s really considered historical, historical fiction. fiction. So I, I just thought that was, uh, you know, very interesting. Made me feel pretty old, actually. I but, felt uh, old the first time the songs that I grew up with showed up as a classic. I'm yeah, like, seriously, ho- Hollow Notes is a classic? Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, but that historical, 70s is historical fiction. And it is. It's, you know, we're wow. talking about 40 years ago, so. Don't, yeah, shush. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Um, I, I'm still amazed we all made it through the year, you know, through the the 1999-2000 thing that we didn't all, you know, the millennium. Yeah, we got through the millennium without without getting crushed, and you know, and then you think back and you're like, wow, this is how people thought about, you know, like the 1850s and when it right. turned to 1900, and now we're the really old folks because we were born in the other century. But, well, uh, I think when, when I was, you know, in the 70s growing up, 40 years earlier than that was the 1930s. And, right. you know, think about how, how different things were between the 30s and the 70s. I don't think there's as much difference now between the 70s and, and our current times, but, but there is a lot that is different. You know, we had television, you know, women all went to college. Those, those kinds of things were, were already in place. But, but so much technology hadn't happened, so many social things hadn't happened. Yep. Um, and it's just interesting to look to look at it from the historical angle. It really is. And then the 80s were kind of blah. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I have a lot to say about the 80s, too. But it's, yeah. you know, it doesn't resonate as strongly for me because, you know, I wasn't quite as young then. <laughs> right. And I, I like that you, you know, explained your choice of publisher because there's a lot of people out there that are wondering how to do things. And I did a um, an interview with someone a couple days ago about you know, multimedia books, and there are some issues with with multimedia books. You can create them through iBook, but then again, um, there's there's a program called iBook Author that only works on a Mac, but that you can create for the Apple Store. But again, since you're using contemporary music or, you know, classics, and you have to worry about the rights and everything, you know, you could include original music, but you wouldn't be able to include 
those songs, but I like the way you set it up that you can have, and even in the ebook, you can have a link that goes to Amazon to play the song. Yeah, or the, and there have been there have been books that did that. There was a Bob Marley, uh, I think a memoir by his a child of his, or somebody wrote, wrote recently um, in the last six months, a, a biography of Bob Marley that does that, that links out to Amazon. But it's very unwieldy, and it's not seamless. I mean, there are ways right. to do it without clearing rights, but, but they're very clunky. Yep. And my hope is that there's a way to do it in the future that, that's not so arduous legally or technically. But yeah. in the meantime, you know, there it is. You can get it on the Kindle. You can get it on the iPad. For some reason, the Nook is still a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is no music directly embedded, but all of the songs are up on the website. So, And I, I love that. That's really cool because that's, you know, like I've had a few other authors that have told me. And they happen to be musicians, so their music is original music. And they've said that they've put the... You know, you can't do true multimedia yet. For one thing, the the size of the files would be way too big. But the, um, you know, he tells you at the beginning of the book to download the soundtrack that goes along with it and listen to it while you're reading the book. And I think that's, again, like you said, it's it's a little unwieldy. You know, you got to remember to stop the soundtrack when you stop reading the book or else things right. won't be in sync. But at least people are um, are looking at ways to do that which to me means that's going to be something that will happen in the future because it's not just you trying to do it. There's a lot of people out there that are trying to, to do things like this. And, well, you and know. I know some of the resistance I got to the idea of a soundtrack, well, it's going to be way too distracting and you're going to be on three pages and the song will still be playing from three pages ago. But, you know, to me, it's more <laughs> of just sort of a, a background kind of, of time, you know, it's a sense of time bought through this music. So I have a playlist on iTunes, you know, you can put it on a CD, you can take it in your car, put it on an iPod, and you just sort of play it in the background while you're reading. And The same way that, for a movie, you know? Like yeah, like you, a soundtrack, exactly. And no, it's not always going to sync up so that when they're in the, in the bar listening to disco, that's exactly what you're hearing on the playlist. But, you know, you can jump around and do whatever you want mm-hmm. if, it's your, if it's music that you own and have access to. So hopefully the publishing gods up there will get the get their acts together and figure that out. Um, music already went through the revolution, you know, that publishing is starting to go through now. So after publishing catches up, then maybe they can get their acts together <clears throat> to be able to uh, coincide and coexist and realize that, you know, people want a multimedia experience now and not just a, not just to read. Um right. Not that just reading, not that just reading is bad, but you know, people are to a point where they want the multimedia experience. Well, I've always felt for this book that hearing, you know, seeing the names of songs and, and even listening to them on the website, a little piece of it, will inspire, you know, at least some some sales of music. For I mean, that is also coming from the music business and caring a lot about paying for music and paying right. for any any kind of media versus stealing it or. Whatever, whatever the uh, politically correct terminology is, um, you know, it's important that, that artists be compensated for their work. And so if you like a song, you know, download it on iTunes. Don't, don't go start looking around to get it for free or listen yep. to it on Spotify, which is advertising supported and, and does pay royalties to, to the artists. Right. That's, uh, that's really awesome. And I didn't know that much about Spotify. I'm familiar with Pandora, but I haven't uh, paid much attention to Spotify. So, Well, the difference between Spotify and Pandora is you can do songs on demand on Spotify. Pandora okay. is wonderful for you. Know, you can create a, a channel with 70s mm-hmm. music, 70s disco. You know, go parse it down as, as detailed as you want, but you can't control what comes next. On Spotify, you can select a particular song to hear. Okay, awesome. And now... How are you going about marketing? You you put it you put it together yourself. You you know you wrote the book. You've got the music, and you've got a website. And how are right. some ways that you're getting the the word out about the book? Well, it does help that I do social media marketing for a living. So I know about tweeting, and I have a Pinterest page. I'm on Tumblr. Um, you know, I, I'm on all of these different social media platforms with the book. I did hire a publicist who worked at doing outreach to some of the more traditional media and some non-traditional like podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've done, you know, I did a TV interview with NBC, local NBC affiliate, and things like that. So she set those up and 
social media side I've, I've done myself, but it's, it's grueling. You know, it's hard to churn out. I've written more than 100 blog posts, uh, songs of the day. You know, I pick a song from the book and write about where it fits in the book, where it fits in the history of music, and, you know, sort of link to a YouTube video. It's, it's, it's very time-consuming. It's great fun, but it keeps me from writing my next book. I was so, just going to say, the next uh, book can be from all the blog posts you had to write. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> How to market That'd your book. That would be easier. So, and that's, that's what I've been doing, and, and uh, so I've been doing a lot of it myself, and uh, it's, as I said, I have a Facebook page for the book, you know, all of that. It's, it's, um, it's time-consuming, but it must be done, because otherwise, you know, it's like throwing it at the bottom of a well. Right. Now, are you using sites like Goodreads? We're still trying to, yes, some of us are still Goodreads trying to well. figure, some of us are still trying to figure Goodreads out. <laughs> well, I, I love it, but yes, I agree. It, I'm not quite sure. How, how it all works, but I have, uh, I uploaded the book to, I uh, upload custom everything to Goodreads, so it's listed there as a, as a book, so hopefully people who have read it can review it there, it's reviewed on Amazon, I uh, don't have any control over that, unfortunately, but uh, actually right. they've, been, they've been pretty positive reviews, and uh, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's about the size of it. Well, and what I what's been really interesting, I've um, I've fallen into because I'm because on Bookities we're doing a lot of outreach, so we're um, you know we're looking into how other people how other websites are working, and um, I come across a, a couple of sites that do a lot of uh, promotion and and a lot of different things. Did you do uh, have, did you do a blog hop? Is that where the hundred articles came in and the guest posts, or were they just you know, from reaching out to uh, places. Oh, no, no, I wrote, I wrote all of them. Okay. No, I haven't really done any of those things. Um, I probably should have, and it might have made my, my life a little easier, but no, I, I wrote everything myself and put it on my own site and, um, you know, tweeted about it and put it on the Facebook page and threw up some photos and Pinterest. Of, uh, there's a, a car, the character's car in the book is a, uh, 67 Oldsmobile, so I found a picture of the car, and put it in, you know, put it in, I found a picture of the back seat, which also plays a role in the story, <laughs> had up on Pinterest, you know, trying to sort of create some visuals to go along with the very extensive audio <laughs> stuff that's in there, and of course the book itself. That's, uh, that's really intriguing, and that's what I have found a lot of, I was surprised when I started um, interviewing authors and they started talking about how they're using Pinterest, and I'm like, really? And they, uh, a lot of them did something, and I'm a photographer, I should have thought of this. Um, you know, take pictures of what your characters look like to, to you. You know, some people that may have inspired your, your characters, or their car, or... Or their clothes, I have a, I have a dress, you know, up there that's like what <laughs> the character would have worn on the New Year's Eve at the, at the, at the gay disco. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's really a fun way of, of doing it. Yep, and I have one that does like a Tuesday, something about Tuesdays, where she'll put up a photo, and then she'll encourage people to comment on whether they agree that it fits in the story or not, and she looks for input from people, you know, by by putting the photos up and sending them, of course, back to her blog to do their comments, and that seems like a really fun thing to do. You're ahead of the game because you already know, like you said, you know how to use social media. There are so many authors that are like, you know, I've got a Facebook page, I have a profile on Goodreads, and, you know, I'm using Pinterest, and I figure that out, but I won't use Twitter because I can't say anything in 140 characters. Or oh, there's, sure you can. Or there's the others that are like, I love Twitter. I have, a, you know, extremely loyal following through Twitter. So it's like they either know... Or they don't know. So, you know, for one of your upcoming books, uh, I know a lot of people would love an author's guide to social media. <laughs> oh, sure. I'll put all of that in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. I've got someone that wants me to do it, and I'm like, okay, but it's not on the top of the burner because, yeah. you know. But, well, um, you know, some of these sites can be very helpful in the writing of a book, too. I think if you have yes. an interest board that's tied to ideas for your next book, whether it's a memoir or historical or even nonfiction, um, you know, throw ideas in there. Put them up on Tumblr, and then you can come back and say, oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. 
And it's one of the things that I'm thinking about doing with a fantasy novel that my son wrote that I'm going to write the sequel to. That's going to be really fun. Wow. Um, that, you know, I've actually been looking around and on Facebook I've started following some folks that are doing some really cool fantasy. They just post fantasy drawings every now and then. And I'm like, yes, that's the dragon I need. And I'm like, yes, that's the female lead that's going to be in the second book that wasn't such a big character in the first book. And yes, that's her little dragon that she's holding on to in her hand. And I'm like, you know, that's a, another trigger is, you know, using the visual. And I was really excited when one of the authors I spoke to said that when she starts a book, she does a visual collage. And I'm like, why didn't I think of that? Again, photographer <laughs> why am i well, different people think different ways you know for me it was music that got everything yep. going but yes uh, having one of, like a bulletin board or the equivalent of a of an idea board is a great idea I'm yeah that one myself yeah so i've uh, you know every one of you every you're my 112th interview of wow. uh of an author in the last uh, six weeks, and you, every single one of you comes up with a new thing. So for other people, they may have mentioned music, but you took music to a new level, and that may resonate with someone who's stuck on a book and they don't know what to do next. And uh, you know, with you saying, listen to some songs that are from the era that are you know about. Well, even if it's current, listen to some songs that that meant something to you at that time if it's about a breakup you know what did you listen yep. to when you had a bad breakup or what what are kids listening to today that are about breakups yep i think we can we can write our own book about how to get through uh block uh, writer's block with all these wonderful well, different i thought things. you were going to say breakups <laughs> Well, that. I don't want to. I don't want to get through another break. I'm done. I've got. I've got the man I love. That's it. I don't want any more breakups. But um, you know, and I, I like that you you've done a relatively happy piece. You said it's a celebration, and I think that that's important too. And I think it's important to have, even though we don't like to think of the '70s as being historical. I like historical novels that are realistic and that are like yours, fully researched. You know, you bring in the the whole climate, and it, it'll be like the Doors movie. You know, like you. Well, what really, what really makes any book though is the characters and the storyline, and and that that to me is the most important thing. Even without music, the book has to work. Even if I don't mention, you know, a drive-in theater or you know a specific location, you have to care about the characters, and that that was really the most fun part of the book too. You know, imagining what what is it going to be like after. You know, she finds out, and what is their conversation going to be, and, and where do they go from there, and how do I end, as I always like to have a happy ending, um, how do I end it so that we feel, you know, optimistic about these characters together, separately, whatever, down the road, um, and it ends on the bicentennial, and they're in New York, so they've got the tall ships going by, I wanted it to be sort of, you know, majestic and hopeful, and, you know, Whatever, whatever they want to have, they're on the cusp of everything, and their dreams can come true. So that that was important too to figure out the arc of the characters who start out as sort of narrow and depressed and confused and, and you know basically teenagers. Yeah. And how do you take them to? They're still teenagers at the end, but but they are hopefully more evolved. You know, they've been dealing with their parent issues. They've been dealing with their relationship issues. Uh, society changes. Going to school. All of these things. And you feel optimistic that, that, that they're figuring it out. Well, and as you, as you did the character development, was that, again, was that like part of your timeline? Was it like you wanted to... Absolutely, hit? absolutely. You know, very depressed, um, you know, have a long talk about issues, you know, have, have a, a, maybe a road trip. There's a road trip uh, in the book. And uh, which is a very, very important part of the book and, and a big change in how the characters relate to each other. Um, you know, how, what is the best way to do it? Is it a road trip? Is it a, a, you know, a rap session or whatever the equivalent is? And I didn't want it to be just talk. I wanted there to be some action. So I took them on the road. <laughs> <laughs> and, like a together. <laughs> well, and that's really, you know, I mean, people may laugh and think that, that, oh, you always end up on the road. So many things can happen on a road trip. Right. And they can be life-changing. You know, you can take a road trip and, you know, no matter how long or short it is, you know, with people that you know and love, or people that you don't get along with at all, and you're forced into it. And yeah, I've had I've had road trips where I never saw those people again afterwards. <laughs> right, exactly. 
So, you know, road trips can be very, um, a way to keep a story going and they can be, you know, like in Harry Met Sally, you know, they started out on a road trip and they didn't like each other so much. And, you know, they... It doesn't have to be a long trip. It can be a train ride to the city. I mean, a a road trip could be a lot of different things that that just give you a chance to put the characters together for some extended period of time and go to a destination that's different from where you've been. So they're very helpful. That's really cool. So if you um, if you had one piece of advice that you could give somebody that's sitting down to start a novel of, of any type, what would that be? To me, I think the most important thing was really feeling like I was living that life. I uh, On the road trip, not to get back to that, but on the road trip, they go to Syracuse in January and there's a huge snowstorm. And so I, I was sitting there trying to think, you know, what would be happening? What would they say to each other? And I actually had to go and get a blanket because I felt cold. I was really in Syracuse, nice. you know, watching the snow come down. And I went to a website and found a picture of a dorm that looked, you know, really depressing. And, you know, so I had that in my mind when I was writing it. And here's the dorm that they're visiting. And here's the snow coming down and the coat's not, not heavy enough. And, and, you know, when you're really in the moment is when you do the best writing. So it's hard sometimes because there are all the distractions and you know I wrote that probably at four o'clock in the morning no oh, yeah that was another thing I was going to talk about but we've talked about so many good stuff did you um, now you you had a full-time other job and you wrote well, this I, I've been a consultant since 1996 so I work from home mm-hmm. and I have a teenager which was also very helpful yeah <laughs> Oh, what's she going through today? Or he going through today? He, yes, he. And, and uh, you know, that was very revealing to me that boys go through a lot of the same stuff as girls do because I, I didn't realize that, it, you know, when I was a teenager, it felt like, you know, we were doing all the suffering and they were just out playing soccer and not caring. Right. <laughs> so it was, it was uh, quite, you know, interesting for me to realize that, you know, you don't have to be a gay guy to have a lot of deep emotions. I mean, I'm making it sound like I was idiot but but uh, you know it was important to me to have I, I think it was it was helpful to me to have my son at the same age when I was writing the book as, as the characters in the book and it definitely informed it I wouldn't want to do it again I'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> then they're done that let's move on oh, yeah. <laughs> so what do you see what do you what do you have planned for your next book if you can ever get to it after the publicity on this one well, I started too. Originally, I was going to do a sequel that, that follows from 76 to 78 and moves into the city because the characters move into the city. And um, I just really, I don't want to talk about teenagers and, and the 70s right now. So I've moved on and I'm, ta- I'm writing about, um, and this is more of a, a nonfiction, not so much a memoir, but a nonfiction book about the early days of interactive multimedia and uh, the technologies and the people who worked on those technologies from uh, 86, 87 through the launch of the web in 95. Wow. I want that and book. And there's some great <laughs> characters. Great characters. Really? I, yeah. I, I want that book. Um, what's really interesting is my day job is a consultant in a specific industry, and my industry didn't even exist until 1995. And, well, social media didn't exist till even later than that. Right. So we're in an era where, um, and including the, and I include this, you know, with the publishing world, they're creating jobs right now that didn't exist a few years ago because right. the big houses did everything, and now authors need to do them for themselves, and authors can self-publish without having to subsidy publish. You know, where you had to go out and, and buy 500 books in order to get published. Now you've got right. the print on demand with, with CreateSpace, and you can focus on, you know, your efforts by using a website and social media. And we're in an era now where people are creating new cottage industries. And I had one person be offended that I said cottage. And I'm like, no, before the Industrial Revolution, what people did is they worked from home you know, whether it was baking bread or, you know, knitting clothes or sewing or whatever, you know, people were working out of their houses and that was called the, you know, it was a cottage industry. And I don't take offense to that word at at all. Now we're, you know, you can call it whatever you want, but we're going back to a cottage industry society. Well, that's the dream. I mean, other than maybe when you're just starting out and you need to be with other people and you want to meet, you know, make those important connections, 
um, you know, people are looking to Etsy and eBay and some of these these uh, opportunities to work from home, mm-hmm. uh, at least for some portion of their career. I mean, yep. like, you definitely don't want to do it all the time because uh, you start talking to yourself. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and we always need the people who are in the in the factories and everything. But you know, those people can have a high turn. There's no longevity in that type of job anymore. So, you know, people always there's there's somebody is good. Everybody is good at something, right? So, and it's just like everybody has a book inside them, and sometimes you just need some help to get it out. Um, you know, figure out what you're good at, and then go out and do it, and be able to you know, sell it to other people. It's like, you know, write what you're passionate about or, because uh, if you don't like your characters in your book, <laughs> nobody else is going to like them either. You right, know? right. Well, I think uh, that was difficult for me because I do have a character. Uh, in fact, the, the main character in the book, when I sent it to my sister, she said, I find that character very unlikable. And uh, I said, really? She said, we've got two very unlikable female characters. And, and so I made, the, you know, one of the characters sort of more confused and, and so that when she did or said things that, that maybe were hurtful or, or not too bright, um, you know, you sort of felt sorry for her versus the other one who's just, you know, sort of more nasty and biting and they play off each other. So that, that was an important thing too. Because you want to be you want to have the characters likable but interesting. And, and right. you know, too too likable is, you know, let's face it, it's pretty boring. Yes. It's gotta have a little edge. Yeah, everybody's gotta have a little edge. So all right. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. And this has well, been thank a, you for asking me. A very eye-opening, as always, uh, eye-opening and, and exciting uh, interview. I hope a lot of our listeners got something out of it. Please tell me again your website that they can go to to find the book. The website is cuspofeverything.com. Okay. And from there, I think you can find links to all of the other social media, the Pinterest and Tumblr and of course, the jukeboxes for the music. Okay. Twitter. Yeah. Uh, well, why don't you give us your Twitter in case they, you know, want to just go straight over there? The Twitter is actually my my name, not the name of the book, because I figure if I ever write a second book, maybe I will yeah. want to use the same one. So it's twitter.com slash Laura Hunt with two T's, H-U-N-T-T, Foti, F-O-T-I. Awesome. And uh, for all of those of you that are listening on iTunes or um, discovering that people are listening to us from TV set-top boxes now, um, again, changing technology. (laughs) Um, If you're not listening from a device that you're on an actual computer, when you do get to a computer, uh, please go to cuspofeverything.com and also go to bookgoodies.com, B-O-O-K-G-O-O-D-I-E-S.com. And do a search for Laura, and you'll find this podcast with some show notes, and you can make comments uh, on the on the show notes. Or if you're a little shy and don't want to put public comments, you can go up into our um, contact us at the top of the page, and you can send us a, a note with your uh, with your impressions and whether you like you know how much you like the the podcast and what questions you might have. And if you want to have us cover a future topic or if you want to be a guest on our podcast, please use the contact us and there's several forms that link to it from there. And we also have a form where you can tell us about your book and you can tell us about your current project and we'll post that up on our site as well. And of course, all of this is uh, free and we are also launching a fundraising campaign so that we can get all of our podcasts transcribed so that all these wonderful nuggets of information can be pulled together into some useful books. So if you know someone that is uh, able to make a small contribution toward that, we would love to have you do that as well. And that's on the bookgoodies.com slash about page. And as always, we want to thank you for listening. I want you to sit down and start writing because if you don't start writing, you're never going to finish writing. So Um, Everybody have a great day.